Instagram.com. The vasopressor trap is one of the most dangerous, life-threatening traps that an ICU patient can find themselves in. That's why it's really important for ICU docs to be able to recognize it. What is an ICU vasopressor trap? How do you get into it? And more importantly, how do you get out of it? So the first thing that you have to understand is the layout of the circulatory system. And here we have the heart. The heart pumps blood out through arteries. And here we have the brain. Here we have the liver. And here we have the kidney. These are the target organs. And if they don't get enough blood, which carries oxygen, those target organs are going to switch over to anaerobic metabolism and make lactic acid. The other thing that you have to realize is that this is where we measure the blood pressure. This is a sphygmometer, and we can see the blood pressure being measured here. And then there are alpha-1 and beta-2 receptors here in these smaller arteries. There are medications called vasopressors, and vasopressors in general will cause constriction by activating the alpha-1 receptor. So when these yellow alpha-1 receptors are stimulated, they will cause vasoconstriction. When they cause vasoconstriction, they're going to cause the blood pressure where we measure it to go up. So vasoconstrictors make the blood pressure go up. What happens typically in a patient who comes into the emergency room and is admitted to the intensive care unit with sepsis is many times these smaller arteries here or these arterioles are dilated. And as a result, the blood pressure here is very low. What we do is we use vasopressors. So vasopressors will cause these smaller arteries to constrict somewhat, and that's going to increase the blood pressure here where our sphygmometer is actually measuring the blood pressure. And that's all fine. But sometimes the patient isn't coming in completely with septic shock. They're actually coming in with something like cardiovascular shock or cardiogenic shock. There's something called the ejection fraction. The ejection fraction is how much of the blood in the heart at the beginning of contraction is ejected at the end of contraction. And normally, it's anywhere between 50 and 60% ejection fraction. But sometimes the ejection fraction can be low in congestive heart failure, somewhere in the order of 10 to 20% or thereabouts. Now, in that situation, because the heart is not pumping very well, the patient can have a low blood pressure at this point. And it may be assumed that this is due to septic shock and vasodilation here in the smaller arteries, but in fact, it's because of the fact that the pump is just not pumping well enough. This is cardiogenic shock. And so the initial thing to do is to start vasopressors. Or there may be septic shock in place where there's vasodilation of these arteries here, but there is still a component of a low ejection fraction. So there's not enough blood flow that's going down this way, and that's causing the blood pressure to go down. And as a result, we start to go up on the vasopressors, and this is where we get into something called the vasopressor trap, because as we start to increase the vasopressors and we get constriction here at the alpha-1, it may improve our blood pressure, at least in the short run, but you can see here that if there's not enough blood getting down here and we're already constricting these smaller blood vessels, that the amount of flow to the target organs is going to be severely impaired. And as a result of that, they will make lactic acid. Now that lactic acid, unfortunately, is going to cause the pH of the entire blood system to go down. And what that does, unfortunately, is it not only makes the heart not pump very well, but it also inactivates, in some degree, the vasoconstrictors. And so there's numerous different vasopressors, and what will happen is that we will start a vasopressor, for instance, called norepinephrine, and we will max it out. And then what will happen is they will call the physician and say, hey, we're maxed out on norepinephrine. Should we add another? And they'll say, yeah, go ahead and add another. And we'll add epinephrine. In this situation, actually, epinephrine has a little bit more beta. We'll talk about beta here in just a second. But these are primarily activating the alpha-1 receptor, which is causing vasoconstriction, which is causing the blood pressure here to go up momentarily. But unfortunately, it's causing more lactic acid, which then feeds back, and then blood pressure falls back down. And we keep tightening and tightening and tightening all of this, and we're getting into a vicious cycle where lactic acid is getting higher and higher. And we'll add another vasopressor here. Let's add, in this case, neosinephrine or phenylephrine. And of course, that causes the blood pressure to go up. I have run into several of these situations over the years where I'll come in and a patient's maxed out on three different vasopressors. And that is usually the sign that we may have been caught in the vasopressor trap. 
And you can see here that instead of going down the vasopressor trap, if we were to somehow know early on that the ejection fraction was low to begin with, then we may have added a different type of vasopressor because you see on the heart are beta-1 receptors. And here in the vasculature are beta-2 receptors. So if we were to add a vasopressor that stimulates the beta-1 and the beta-2, you can see what would happen is we would increase the ejection fraction. We would increase the amount of blood flow going through here, which would then naturally increase the blood pressure. We would then open these up and vasodilate them and allow more blood to go to these target organs, therefore reducing lactic acid and allowing the heart to pump better. If you've thought here that maybe a medication that's pure beta, like dobutamine, might be the ticket out of the vasopressor trap, you'd be absolutely correct. So once I had a patient that had come in and was on three different vasopressors, the patient's blood pressure was continuing to fall, and I could tell that there was an elevated neck veins, there was edema, However, there was no echocardiogram, so I took the ultrasound machine and looked at the patient's heart, could see that the patient's heart was not moving very well, and so was at risk of a low ejection fraction, and I immediately told the nurse to add dobutamine and to start methodically pulling off some of the worst offenders of vasopressors, even if the blood pressure were to go down slightly, because the only way out of this situation was to back off out of these vasopressors, allow perfusion, allow lactic acid to come back down to normal, and then we would get back to the situation that we were. Because if we were to continue in this situation, what would happen is the pH would continue to drop, the lactic acid would continue to go up, and eventually the heart would stop. So as you can see, it's really important to be able to, in real time, figure out what the heart function is. And the best way to do that is to look at the heart with the ultrasound in real time. And we actually have a course on this at medcram.com. Our ultrasound expert, Dr. Joshua Jaquette, has actually authored a number of these ultrasound courses, for instance, like Ultrasound Explained Clearly with Principles and Instrumentation, The Fast Exam, Lung Ultrasonography, and also Lung Ultrasound in COVID-19. And you can see there's been a number of reviews, and they've all gotten close to five stars out of five. We also have a Vasopressors and Inotropes Explained Clearly course, which you can see has received over 345 reviews and is 4.9 out of 5 stars. So I hope you understand now what is known as the vasopressor trap, how to avoid it, and more importantly, how to get out of it if you ever find yourself in one. If you found this video helpful, please subscribe, turn on notifications, and join us at medcram.com.